This is going to illustrate how to start a Zoom meeting. Click New Meeting, and that will pop up a screen that will illustrate everyone that's currently joining. Um, good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes? All right. Very good. Um, I want to give a brief overview of how I approach using um, Zoom. Um, this advice may differ from what you've heard before, but it's been my own experience. Um, so I make a... F okay. Sorry, Lane, you're not hearing sound. Um, the first point that I want to clarify is that um, teaching online is going to be a little bit different than you're used to. Um, one of the reasons why is it's very sterile. Um, it feels forced. Uh, so when I try to teach online to the extent possible, I make it as real as possible. Um, I know a lot of people, for example, have enjoyed the virtual backgrounds. I would encourage you not to use it. Um, it's gimmicky. It looks artificial. It creates a further layer of disconnect between you and the students. Um, we should be trying as hard as possible uh, to make this sound normal. Uh, so I would use whatever backgrounds in your office and I would not focus on the uh, uh, virtual backgrounds. Um, try to appear as you would in class. Uh, if it's possible to stand, um, I would stand if you're at a lectern. Uh, if it's not possible, then you can sit. But try to maintain at all junctures the appearance of normalcy. Um, one of the ways you actually have to do this is by maintaining eye contact. Um, this is not natural. Usually when uh, people speak, their eyes kind of wander around, they look here, they look there. And in person, that's not a big deal. But when you are speaking to a camera, it looks very disconcerting. Um, if you ever watch a TV personality, they're very good at maintaining eye contact right at the lens. And they don't move their eyes. In fact, the teleprompters are right over the cameras. They don't have to. Um, I don't expect people to become experts, but to the extent you can, try to maintain eye contact. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is screen sharing. Um, I may be a little bit unpopular with this, but I would discourage screen sharing. Um, the reason why is when you have a PowerPoint either on the full screen or at least most of the screen, uh, students, I think, will disconnect. Um, most PowerPoint presentations are not nearly as interesting as their authors think they are. And I don't mean that as a slur, it's just they're, they're, they can be dry. Um, to the extent that we have what's called synchronous communication, that is back and forth with you know, right now we have 30 people um, on the line. I would ensure that we can all see each other as much as possible. When you go into PowerPoint mode, they're not going to see their classmates. They're not going to see you as much. And you can do a thing with a side by side. I understand, but I think there are restrictions. If you want to do PowerPoints, I would even suggest having multiple components. Have an asynchronous component where you are actually lecturing to a PowerPoint slide and then have a synchronous component that's more Socratic or more asking questions. There's no reason why you have to do one or the other. Uh, you can do both. Um, and if all you're doing is speaking to a PowerPoint, you can have that students watch it on demand before class. Um, this is what's known as the flipped classroom model. Um, I gave a faculty presentation on this uh, a few months ago. It feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, but the general gist is if there's some sort of mechanical pre-recorded content that students don't have to interact in, make it a video and let them watch it in advance. And then when they come to class, they can have more discussion. Um, usually we can't do this from the semester because we don't have time. Well, my friends, we have a lot of time right now, and this might be a good opportunity to experiment with a flipped classroom. Uh, so if you do have your sort of PowerPoint lectures, make that the asynchronous component. Make it a required lecture. They can watch it on their own time whenever they get a few minutes. And then at the regularly scheduled class time, that's where you engage in the Socratic. Now I want to actually illustrate how I would do the Socratic. Uh, let's see, does anyone here want to uh, a volunteer? I'll just, I'm going to piss, uh, pick Chris Rogers because he knows what he's doing. Very good. So what I want Chris to do just to show you all is what it looks like to raise a hand. Now you see, oh Terry did it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, oh, and Kevin and everyone else. 
All right, so you see over here on the right side of the screen, there's participants. You see a little blue hand next to Terry, a little blue hand next to Chris, a little blue hand next to Chris, uh, uh, Doug. The raising of the hand is an option for students to get your attention. And in fact, if you actually look at the grid mode, you'll see little blue hands throughout. And this is a similar feature to when your actual students raise their hand. So I can call on uh, uh, Terry and I can unmute him. And then that now Terry can talk. Does Terry start talking? Uh, you, you can actually unmute me. What the, you can do is request that I unmute yes. myself at all, just to let you know. Yes. yes. And then I'm, what I would I'm, usually I'm do, your if, I, if I want to talk to Terry, I can actually click Spotlight Video, right? If you actually click on Terry's name and there's a little button that says More, you can click Spotlight Video. And the advantage of the Spotlight Video is that everyone sees Terry at once. Ah, so a question is only the host sees the blue hands. Um, I'm going to post a screen record of this later so you'll see what I'm talking about. But the host will see the blue hands. Now I'm talking to Terry, right? Uh, we're going back and forth. Terry says something, but then I say something. So the camera goes back to me and I say something, but then I click Terry Spotlight. If you, if you click on Terry's name, Spotlight, he goes back and forth. This requires a lot of on the fly um, interaction with the professor. I don't pretend this is easy, but the idea is it's not a one-sided communication, right? You're not just looking at me for an hour straight. You can go back and forth. Um, if you don't want to use a spotlight feature, you can go to the grid feature. And if you right click on anyone's video, I'm sorry, if you click on anyone's video, you go pin. So I can pin Chris up to the front of the screen. I can, I can pin Doug McNabb to the screen. Right, you can pin people. And the advantage of the pinning is you can easily view a large number of people. Now, um, I see Andrew's a question. Things work differently based on the version of Zoom you're using. It's true. Um, if you're on your phone or your iPad, uh, there's gonna be some limited functionality. Um, I encourage your students if they have a laptop, which I hope they do, maybe they don't, but if they have a laptop to download the app, which is a lot more features, okay? Um, the second thing that I want to illustrate is the chat feature. Um, so if you click chat along the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little box pops up. Um, I'd encourage you to leave this open during the class. Now, uh, some professors may not want this chat. I, I, I understand why, um, but the short answer is students are going to use it. Um, not all students are comfortable jumping in with the blue hand raising feature and not all students are comfortable with um, uh, 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 trying to just jump in and start talking. They may put a question there. So I would just glance down at the, um, uh, at the chat, you know, every, every few moments. Uh, don't, don't stare at it, but every now and then um, glance at it. Okay. Uh, next, I want to talk about the polling feature. Now, a couple of you asked about this yesterday. Um, in the host view along the bottom, there's a button that says polling. If you click on it, um, oh yes, and Kevin says, turn our private chat. Absolutely, they should not be chatting privately. Uh, that should be disabled. I, I agree, Kevin, entirely. It is disabled. Ah, okay, then it's disabled. Thank you, Chris, I appreciate that. Um, so to add a question is actually pretty straightforward. You click polling. And I'm just going to add one very quickly. Should have done this in advance. Uh, what do we think of Zoom? It's great and it's terrible. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to now administer this poll. All right, if everyone wants to just take a minute. Okay, one of you thinks it's terrible. Okay. Um, the polling feature, I think, is a fairly easy way to experiment with what people think. And then you can all see the results. Um, if you want to actually um, do meaningful testing, the iClicker software is very good. 
um, that allows you to record a student's performance. So from class to class, you know how they perform. So I would encourage the eye clicker um, as well. Okay. Uh, next thing I wanted to try was the breakout rooms feature. Um, because a couple of our professors do skills classes and some of the more smaller lecture classes um, uh, uh, were asking about this. So along the bottom of your screen, you have this button that says breakout rooms. And if you click that, you can basically divide people. So we have 30 people and I can say divide them into six rooms. And I'm going to do this randomly. You can also do it manually, but I'll do it randomly for now. I'll go create breakout rooms. Okay, and I'm about to move all of you into breakout rooms for about a minute, and just so you can see how this works. So I go open all rooms. Okay, so now you've all been invited to join these various breakout rooms, and you should be able to. And you can see the various people in the rooms. Now, I just did this at random, but I think any uh, professor or any uh, uh, skills teacher can assign these deliberately. If there are three specific people you want to assign, you can. And see, almost all of you have joined them fairly easily. Um, these are good for using uh, uh, help. Um, I'm going to close the breakout session now. OK, everyone comes back in. Um, this is also useful, I think, for office hours, right? Uh, let's say you have office hours for you know 90 minutes. You could assign a student to a private breakout room uh, then you can join it, and that way it's sort of a one-on-one -on -one communication, and you don't have to worry about you know all of your students' friends hearing any sort of private talks. Um, uh, but I think it's a very useful approach. Okay. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about um, is actual handle. Just real quick. Yes, please. Uh, one of the advantages to the breakout rooms uh, is they are not recorded in the main only the main session is recorded so if you are using those for office hours well, there's been an express problem with recording the the office hours so that would be one way to avoid that thank Sorry you to... exactly yeah the breakouts i think are a good method i think terry's exactly right because they're not recorded they're private um by default my friends everything you do is recorded uh not everything will be saved because they have limited space in the cloud but the second you all open up Zoom, it starts to record immediately. So just be cognizant of that. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is recitation. Um, and this also gets a little bit particular because professors do it so many different ways. Um, John, yes. Um, I did have a question. How did you get into the breakout rooms in the first place? I, I don't know which which what you clicked. Right. Oh, who's talking? I just so I know. Oh, this is Fran. Oh, hey Fran, how are you? Uh, and let me. I'm going to put you front and center so everyone can see you. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the answer, an oh, you don't have a camera on. Okay, sorry, Fran. So to answer your question, there are things that I see that uh, that you don't see. Um, when you're in the host mode, there's a button along the bottom that says breakout sessions. And if you click that, it will pop open. And Fran, if you want, I can walk you through it later, one-on-one, uh, -on -one if that if that. Oh, that's no, up. that's good. That makes sense to me. Thank okay. You. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is recitation which is going to be a little bit different for a lot of reasons. Um, when you call on a student in class, there's always some sort of delay as they kind of get their act together. They realize, oh my God, I just got called on. What the heck's the answer? Um, <clears throat> that's still present, but you also have an additional concern. They have to get their tech ready. Um, specifically, they may have to turn their microphones on, they may have to turn their cameras on, uh, maybe they have to take their dogs off their laps, maybe they have to, you know, get out of the bathroom. I, I'm, I'm being a little bit gross, but it's true. Um, I think cold calling might be one thing that should be modified, at least for now. Um, and the way that I recommend doing it is alphabetical order. Um, the reason why I prefer alphabetical order is they know where they are in the pecking order. Um, now, again, there's no surprises. They know when they're up, but they can at least be meaningfully prepared for who is the next person to be called on. You're not going to have this weird situation where uh, uh, you call on someone, it takes them 30 seconds to get ready. Every time you call on a student and they need some time to ramp up, that, <clears throat> that, uh, 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 that creates time. Now, Kevin says, instead of using the alphabetical order, use the old seating chart, that works also. As long as they're 
some structured way that they know when they're next, I think it minimizes the amount of time. Because it's very disconcerting to say, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith. It kills your rhythm where you usually have a much more free-flowing conversation. Um, at the outset of class, make sure everyone's muted. Um, and there are ways of doing this by settings, but again, people may unmute themselves. So if you start hearing feedback, just say, please, everyone mute yourselves. And you can also click a button that says mute all. If only this feature existed in real life, and I could just mute the entire class <laughs> in one, I, I wouldn't want that. I think my students value speech, but we can mute them all in one fell swoop. Um, okay, now uh, uh, back to, uh, let me make one last point, and this is just food for thought. Um, we're talking a lot about exams. Um, now, some people say, do we make exams pass fail? I'm going to leave that for the dean. That's not my decision to make, and other people can decide it. But to the extent we want to do exams, I think Zoom might be a very good method of keeping people honest um, while they're taking their exams, have their cameras running. Um, I know that sounds insane and big brother, uh, but they're already recorded. Um, I think that will not eliminate cheating, but I think it will reduce cheating because if they know there's a camera on them, they can't be turning to the guy next to them and picking up their phone and calling someone. Um, that also ensures they're taking the exam at the time we want them to take it. I'm sure there's ways with exam soft to restrict this and they can, you know, uh, the, the examify, whatever the heck it's called. But um, Zoom may be a good way for a proctor to actually keep eyes on all 80 students in my property class to make sure that it looks like they're taking their exam. Um, now, whether we move to a pass-fail, again, that's a decision beyond my purview. Um, <clears throat> I think Zoom might be a good, useful way to um, address some of these issues. Um, the last bit I can mention is screen sharing, and um, uh, there are <clears throat> different ways of doing screen sharing. And again, I'm hesitant to um, to even mention this because I think it's a it should be discouraged for for the Zoom communication. But if you click Share Screen, you can bring up a PowerPoint, and there are options. You can go Share Computer Sound. You also optimize your sharing for video clips. I click both those options. Okay, right now you should see my uh, screen resume share. Okay, um, one of the downsides of the screen sharing is, is you have reduced views. So you can still click and see various people, you just can't see quite as many people at once. Okay, okay, very good. Um, so you, you have the option, but you basically have to tell your students to do the side by side. The teacher can't force, like with everything, the teacher can't force the students to learn. They have to sort of do things on their own. Okay, I'm going to stop the screen sharing right now. Um, okay, so there we go. Oh, oh, this is what I show. So Terry's here. If you click uh, view options and click side by side. So at the top, it says view options as an option for side to side. And then you can basically adjust how much is dedicated for the PowerPoint and how much is dedicated for professors by sliding this bar um, in the middle. And that, that's how you, you would do it. Okay, thanks, Terry. Okay. All right, um, that's all the remarks I had prepared. Um, let's try and do the Q&A with raising hands. I know it sounds stupid, but uh, uh, this is probably how your students will be, be working. So if anyone wants a question, raise your hand. I'd be happy to call on them. Okay, Gary, yes, sir. Yes, uh, I want to talk about taking attendance and you said chat, how do you save the chat? Okay. Have everybody check in. Okay, so two things on attendance, Gary. Um, have you ever used the iClicker software before? No. I would encourage you use it, and let me explain why. Um, it lets you keep track of students from class to class. Um, it automatically generates a role. It creates a roster of attendance, and it tells you in a given class how many were present and how many were absent. And it lets you go from class to class and shows everyone what their attendance looks like. Um, so Gary, if you haven't used it before, give Terry or Chris a call. I'm sure they can help you set it up. Your students probably have it from the other sections. Uh, I would not use the um, the, the chat feature as your primary attendance mechanism because it creates work for you. You'd have to physically transpose all the people type present from the chat into your role. Whereas with the iClicker, it keeps track automatically 
um, and you can see who's who's there. That that would be my recommendation. Does that that makes sense, Gary? Okay. Okay. But but if I did want to take it from the chat and transpose. Yes. So Gary, I, if if you look at the bottom right hand corner of the chat window, do you see there's like three dots? The three dots. Yes. If you go save chat. Okay. A window will pop up. And it saves it to your computer, and you can view it later. As I think it's a text file or something like that. Yeah, it's a text file. Um, so I'll just show you. This is what it looks like. Oh, I'm sorry, I closed it. It's pretty archaic. It's just basic the timestamp, who said it, and what they said. So I mean, this is not sophisticated, but it is useful if you want to uh, retain that for the future. So at the end of each class, you would click um, save. And, and uh, Terry and Chris, I think also it, it saved in the cloud as well. Is that is my memory right on that one? Uh, there's an option where it can be saved in the cloud. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Engaged uh, throughout the class and getting immediate feedback um, on um, what they're taking in and perhaps the effectiveness of your teaching strategy. Th thank you, Richard. That, that I, I could not agree more. I've been using iClicker now for about four or five years, and it's great. I have no, I never bring a paper roll to class anymore. I start every class with a multiple choice question and students can actually track their progress. Are they getting it right or wrong? Right after you do the poll, um, you can actually s click correct or incorrect and students know what their um, answers are. I want to uh, just go to the chat for a minute. Um, Amanda, uh, Amanda Peters had a, had a comment. She said, to take roll, you can just look at the names of the participants. Um, you can do that, it's easy enough. I encourage students to put their names as last name comma first, like Blackman comma Josh. That way they're all sorted um, alphabetically. Because right now you have Amanda Cooley, Amanda Peters, Andrew Solomon, right? And that makes it hard to take attendance. Um, but that works as well. Uh, Fran asks, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, this is Amanda Peters. I'm noticing that on the participants lists, aside from me, aside from you, and aside from people who have their hands up, the names are alphabetized by first name. And that's the same way in Stanley. When you look at your role, they're alphabetized by first name. So if you were to print off a list from Stanley oh. of your students, it really pretty much mimics this oh, list. Great. Uh, so whether you do last name, first name, it doesn't matter however you take your role, but that's an option. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's great. I My list is by last name, but maybe I'm using a different, a different attendance. But yeah, that works very well. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Fran had a question as well. Um, if you save a chat at the beginning, it doesn't save everything. You have to save it at the end of the call, right? So saving at the outset won't get everything. Just make sure it's one last thing you do before you sign off. I, I agree with Richard. Um, uh, 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 we have to adapt. Um, this might go on for the rest of the semester and who knows if this outbreak occurs next year at the same time. Um, so to the extent we want to keep education as normal as possible, um, we can try to uh, simulate our classes, but we have to, we have to adapt. Uh, Helen has her hand up. Uh, Helen. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to go back and play with the breakout rooms because I need that. So um, when you have all of the breakout rooms uh, assigned, I assume there's something that brings all the breakout rooms back to the yeah. screen, yes? Yes, yes, Helen. Okay. How many breakout rooms can you have? I don't know. Uh, let me... Um, uh, I am seeing as many as... It's letting me do 30 rooms. I'm just... I just oh, I just yeah, maxed out. I could get seven. <laughs> so, so, so the answer is a lot of rooms. Oh, oh, I did I did five, Helen, a few minutes ago. You can do seven. That, that's not a problem. Okay. And you could, and you can assign specific students specific rooms for five minutes. And when it's over, you say, "All right, everyone, come back in." And it's automatic. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, other questions. Gosh, is it literally automatic? Yes. Um, was that Elaine? Who was that? Yeah. I think I know your voices. That's actually excellent. Um, uh, Oh, we're, we're friends here. Yeah, w when you click, um, I can do it again. I'll just assign you all to breakout rooms. Uh, I'll just assign all of you into three breakout rooms. I'll go so open all rooms. Is that a quick process, Josh? V very simple. Uh, it's it's three clicks. So I'm going to open. 
Is that who's is that Andrew? Comment. Yeah. This is John Bauman. Um, the last time we went into breakout rooms, just so you're aware, we lost. If you were talking, we couldn't hear you. I know. We could only hear each other. Th that's the idea. Yeah. So John, to answer your question, if I say everyone go to your breakout rooms, we'll return in five minutes. That means for five minutes you're not going to see me. Now. I think the host can go in and out of the breakout. Room. Yeah, I can I can enter the host can enter a breakout room, but by default I'm still in my own little world. If that makes sense. So let, let's try the breakout room again. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to assign you all into three breakout rooms. Open. Okay, so now you've all been invited to join. Okay, I'm going to join breakout room number one. All right, now I am in breakout room number one. I, I see you all, You're, it's our little cozy group. I'm going to exit and I'm going to join breakout room number two. Now, hey everyone, this is Josh. I am in your breakout room number two. I'm going to exit and then go to number three. Bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. And this is Josh. I am seeing you now in breakout room number three. Now I'm going to dissolve the breakout rooms. Close all rooms. Return to main session. Okay. Now everyone, everyone slowly comes back into the main room. And participants are always muted on entry, so that's why you're muted right now. You might not have been a second ago. Right. So that that was. I'll wait till everyone comes back in. the The breakout process is relatively painless. And I think as long as you tell your students you'll be in the breakout for say five minutes, whatever it is, they'll know to come back, or you can force them back. Uh, but it, 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 it's it's fairly straightforward. I think we have almost a full roster back in this room. Okay, I mean, we may, we may have lost them along the way. They're 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 lost souls for the cause, but uh, they they died for a valiant cause. Um, uh, so that's how the the breakouts operate. Uh, now, okay, I think we're at full strength. Josh, yes, Josh, what is what is the setting that highlights the box of the individual who's speaking? I do that manually. So whenever you whenever someone's speaking, I click on them and I go spotlight video. And that brings them to the four. And then let's say Jeff starts talking, I'll go spotlight Jeff. And then if Vanessa starts talking, I'll go spotlight Vanessa, right? And I can switch back and forth. Or if I'm talking, I'll go spotlight Josh, right? That requires someone, professor. Oh, Jeff, now you're actually talking. If someone starts talking, does it automatically switch to them or it does not unless you spotlight them? I think it has a feature where it can automatically go back and forth. Um, I prefer the manual control because if there's crosstalk, it will jump back and forth, can be distracting. Yeah, I, I think Zoom just kind of does it too. Like if, if you're in the gallery view, it just highlights that person so that you can see who's talking, I believe. Yeah, I, pre yeah, I prefer the spotlight feature precisely because it I can control where the camera goes. It's like you're almost a producer in a movie, right? You know where the camera's going. Yeah, it was highlighting uh, yesterday for me, but it's not today. So I didn't know if maybe I checked the box or unchecked the box. Uh, well, right now, Doug, everyone sees you, so you're, 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 you're loud and clear. There seems to be a time lag between when someone starts talking and when their uh, picture comes up in the speaker view. That, that's correct. And who's that talking now? Is that John? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, there's going to be a little bit of latency. Um, it, it, it's, you know, n now you are there. Um, I, I was getting better at it when I was in my class because I was going alphabetically because I could just see who was next in the list and, and sort of know where they were and select them before I called on them, if that makes sense, which is why the there's less of a latency. Now, whoever wants to speak up, I have to sort of hunt and find them in, in, the, in the roster. Just by the way, also on a lot of the tech lists, uh, they're talking about Zoom running a little slower these days than was normal before. I suspect that's because almost everyone is using it. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Esther, I think give a hand up. Yes. Um, can you just remind us where the spotlight feature is? You can't see that as the guest. Right? As the host in the participant window, if you click on someone's name, there'll be an option for more. And then it says spotlight. So whenever you click on someone's name, you can click, you know, spotlight uh, John or spotlight Matt or spotlight whomever you want. Is that a, uh, an icon or does it just say spotlight? When you put your mouse over someone's name, there's a little button that says more and there'll be a little menu that drops down and you can select spotlight. Yeah, I, unfortunately there's no way of doing this by yourself. If you have a friend or someone else, you can just do a two person zoom. It's actually very useful to uh, test it out. I think Gary has his hand up and then Elaine has her hand up as well. Gary? Yes, I noticed that on the participant list, there's at least one of us that's identified as, quote, iPhone. Is there a way to uh, yeah. have them actually show who they are as opposed to... Who are you, iPhone? Who, ide identify yourself. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, uh, uh, Chris or Terry, is there a way to force someone to... Yes, it, it, I'm sharing my screen. Um, there is, uh, when they join the meeting, they would be putting in a meeting number, and whatever their device is automatically named comes up in the name. Ask them to put their real name in there instead of whatever's automatically populated. They can just highlight over it and retype student so-and-so. And, and this is also where they would put their last name comma first in this window if that's something they would want to do. Order you tell them, yes. So in the join meeting window, there's this particular, uh, that's what the button looks like for them, the window, and they would enter in your meeting number and what their, what their name is in whatever fashion you tell them. Okay, thank you for that, Chris. Thank you, thank you, Dean. Um, is there anyone else that has a question? I don't want to take people later than I promise, but anyone else uh, want to have any questions? You can email me. Uh, if not, uh, thank you all. I hope you enjoy your spring breaks. Um, <laughs> uh, sunny Houston in, in March, um, and uh, good luck for classes when we resume. Uh, whenever we resume, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.